been duly called and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. It is 601. Uh, if you would stand with me as Dr. Brown leads us in our invocation and um, uh, Mr. Kidd leads us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for all the things that you enable us to do for the opportunity to serve. We pray that as we serve, that we will understand the full meaning of public service that we've been uh, appointed and not anointed, that we need to be responsible to the citizens, to administration, to the students, to the faculty, for making good decisions. Help us to do that. Give us good judgment. Guide us. Help us to not have any hidden agendas, but to be open, transparent in everything that we do. These things we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Kid. So, item 2-8, uh, Dr. Stockton, Special Dis District Recognition, uh, 2014 UIL Class 5A Boys Long Jump Champion. I'd like to ask Tommy Johnson, Principal of Oak Ridge High School, to come to the podium to introduce our special guest. Tommy Johnson, Principal of Oak Ridge High School. Mr. Huskins, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board, we could not be prouder of our prouder of our state's champion in the long jump, Tremaine Jefferson. Tremaine has done a fantastic job this year, and a lot of the credit goes to his coach. And at this time, I would like to introduce the head track coach at Oak Ridge High School, Dennis Milstein. Dr. Dr. Stockton, School Board, and the rest of the audience. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and be able to recognize Tremaine. Um, he's a tremendous athlete, um, great guy to have on the team, and the best thing was about he's just such a team player. Um, we hear so much about the long jump, but this year was actually his first year to long jump, which, which makes it pretty special. Wow. Um, last year, they were in a little deeper into the basketball playoffs, and so we didn't get him out very long, so he was just high jumping, just running a little bit, and he had also suffered a little injury and was in a cast, so he couldn't do some do some certain things there. So over the break, we kind of talked him into wanting to long jump and do some things like that. Um, his first meet, he went, he jumped, and everybody's jaws kind of drop, and he's, he looks around, he's like, what just happened? He wasn't real sure you know, how far he actually went the first time. Um, but his very first jump ever was, well, at that meet, was 22 feet and a quarter of an inch, which is further than most people will ever jump in their life. <laughs> and then... He continued to win six meets straight, including the state the state meet, and broke our school record by 19 inches. <laughs> a school that's been around for 30 years broke it by 19 inches. Um, and also, I would like to recognize his coach, the, the long jump coach, which is Peter Hurchin, who is a, officially a volunteer coach for us. Stand up, come on up. <laughs> so, I get the honor of, of talking to you, but he's a little probably deserves a lot more credit of, of what he did. Oh. Oh. Did he want to say a real quick word? Um, my, my biggest thing I've noticed about Tremaine is how much he's grown throughout the season. I got to see him during the basketball season and, and didn't get to know him as well as I did with, with basketball. But with track, it, it's amazing how much he really is a professional, the way that he conducts himself. And uh, one thing, when he went to the state, turn, the state track meet, I heard him say this to another one of his teammates he heard some other guys playing some some music, and he's like, "Man, you gotta you gotta watch what you're listening to. You gotta watch what people are looking because there's college coaches everywhere." And I got to see firsthand uh, when he had, took his visit to LSU, just how professional he looked, uh, just the way that he conducted himself, and, and I was extremely proud of 
the, the way that he is on and off of the track. Awesome. Thank you. So Tremaine Jefferson would come up and he has signed a track scholarship with the University of Houston. So. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Good job. Good discovery, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that young man's character as much as we do his talent. Um, item 2B, Special District, uh, uh, Dr. Stockton, Special District Recognition, Custodial and Maintenance Department Employees. I'm very excited about this item. We've got great employees who do wonderful things every day so our, our students and our adults have great environments. And I'm just so proud of all of them. So it's my pleasure to introduce Marshall Schrader, who's the Director of Custodial Maintenance. Dr. Stockton, members of the board, it's my pleasure to present the ambassador recipient for the Maintenance and Custodial Department tonight. Uh, these five employees represent the highest degree of service uh, to Conroe ISD administrators, staff, students, and community. Uh, please come forward to be recognized as I call your name. From North Maintenance, Rocio Salinas Carranza. <laughs> Rossi has been with the district since November of 2000. He's a grounds crew leader. His coordinator is John Brown. Uh, he's a dedicated employee that's always willing to help others, always come to work with a positive attitude, ready for another day. From North Custodial, we'll just stay right there. Jose Grimaldo. There you go. Jose's been with the district since October 1998. He's a day custodian at Grangerland. Uh, coordinator Rodney Shelton. Uh, Jose, Jose is a dedicated, hardworking, and always willing to do whatever is necessary to fulfill the custodial needs of the district. From South Maintenance, Edgar Perez. <laughs> Edgar's been with the district since May of 2010. He's an HVAC lead technician. Coordinator is Mark Freeze. Edgar's a great employee who, always, who is always available and works hard to make sure the HVAC systems in Conroe are always in working order. From South Custodial, Gloria Martinez. <laughs> Gloria has been with us since August of 2012. She's a level one evening custodian at Tom Cox. Um, coordinator is Sydney Strong. Uh, she's a dependable, hardworking employee that represents our department and our district well. Also from South Custodial, Lisa Carver. <laughs> Lisa's been with the district since November of 2010. Uh, she works out of our south office. She handles our facility rentals, uh, interacting with community and campus administrators to coordinate facility rentals throughout the district. Thank you. <laughs> on behalf of the, the board and the entire district, thank you guys so much for everything that you do, for keeping our kids safe, for just making it a wonderful uh, you know, facilities and everything, and uh, you really are truly an asset to the district, and, and we're very, very thankful and grateful for your service. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Congratulations. Thank you for all you do. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Th
Item 2C, uh, Dr. Stockton, Special District, district Recognition. Um, we've got some Assistant Principals of the Year in the room. We do. And to intro those, introduce those uh, recipients, we have Dr. Gibson, Elementary Education Assistant Superintendent, and Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education, Curtis Null. Good evening, Mr. Husband's board members and Dr. Stockton. It's my honor to introduce to you Mrs. Teresa Waller, who is one of our Assistant Principals at Grangerland Intermediate, who was named Assistant Principal of the Year by the Texas Elementary Principals and Supervisors Association, commonly known as TEPSA for Region 6. This is a peer-based award that recognizes assistant principals who have demonstrated outstanding leadership. And Mrs. Waller was recognized at the TEPSA Awards reception on June 11th at the Austin's Renaissance Hotel. Mrs. Waller is a graduate of Conroe High School and has been Assistant Principal at Grangerland for eight years. In 2006, she was also named Elementary Teacher of the Year at San Jacinto Elementary. She is currently our summer school principal at Grangerland, and I can personally attest to her dedication and her perpetual positivity. Please join me in honoring Mrs. Teresa Waller. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Husbands, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board. Each year, the Texas Association of Secondary School Principals, or, TA, or TASSP, recognizes outstanding principals and assistant principals from the 20 regional education service centers in the state. I'm proud to say that once again, the Region 6 Assistant Principal of the Year hails from Conroe ISD. Paula Nicolini has enjoyed a very diverse 27-year educational career, working with kindergartners all the way up through college students. <laughs> She has spent the last four years in Conroe ISD serving as an assistant principal at Conroe High School. Students, teachers, and parents appreciate her high energy level, passion, and unwavering belief that her students will be successful. She played an integral part in the successful first year that the Conroe High School ninth grade campus enjoyed. Now, one thing I must mention is that Ms. Nicolini will not be able to defend her title as assistant principal of the year next year because next year she will be serving as the principal at Hawk High School for us, so that's a great thing for her. Please join me in congratulating our Region 6 TASSP Assistant Principal of the Year, Ms. Paula Nicolini. I just have to say before these ladies leave the stage that we all know that principals get all the glory for when their schools do the best and are the best. And Connor ISD has some great principals, but we also have some really great assistant principals who do a lot of the dirty work and they, they work very hard. So we're very appreciative of what they do for us and our students. We do have a wealth of talent. Ms. Nicolini, did you start when you were 12? 27 years? 27 years? Wow. Okay. Ms. Ferris, do we have anyone registered to yes, speak do. tonight? Very good. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation <laughs> by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act on any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative <laughs> level 
a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations of five or more must appoint one representative to represent their views to the board. Mrs. Ferris, would you please call the first person that signed up to address the board? Taylor Cap. Thank you. Uh, to the Board of Trustees of Conroe ISD, my name is Taylor Cap, CEO and co-founder of k &L Facility Advisors. I'm here today to address the vote for Section 4, titled Administration, Subsection B, titled LED Lighting Retrofit Project, being considered for funding this evening. I am here after exhausting all informal attempts with regards to the facts pertaining to this project this evening being overlooked. I am here to ensure for public record is my opinion a minimum of $619,410.70 may be spent unnecessarily in reference to the LED lighting retrofit and an extra spend of utilities of over $26,000 annually over the following 10 years. <clears throat> also, the board need be aware that all criteria has been met pertaining to the fixture schedules being presented. k &L Facility Advisors is a manufacturer rep agency of a publicly traded company, Orion Energy Systems, established in 1996. Orion Energy Systems has installed over 10,000 facilities and is a $100 million company possessing 64 patented or pending patents of energy efficiency technology. I want to make sure the facts are presented for public record so a sound decision can be made for the taxpayer dollars being requested for the district. Let me explain. I have both a letter from the Orion Energy Systems confirming their support and concerns to the above. The CEO of Orion sent to uh, portions of the letter that I will discuss to Conroe ISD dated June 10th, 2014. From the CEO. I have been in contact with our independent sales agency, k &L Facility Advisors. They inform me that the recommendation is to contract with a vendor, Extralight, which is $617,000 higher than the Orion and k &L Facility Advisor proposal. It is our understanding that your primary critical issue is to provide an upgrade for the school district from T12 lighting to solid state LED lighting. LED lighting is more sustainable and longer lasting to permanently reduce energy consumption and is eligible for utility incentives expiring this year for T12s. Most importantly, you wish to ensure that professional services and technologies are completed without disruption to the classroom within a specified time frame of November 15, 2014. More specifically, a team was formed to evaluate several vendors, Brookstone, PBR, and Conroe ISD Planning and Construction. Bidders were to complete their bids and deliver them to Brookstone by 2 p.m. Thursday, June 5th, at which time the bids would be read aloud for public record. Bids were as follows. Pinnacle Inline, $4.15 million. Orion, $2.872 million. Extra late, $3.49 million. Bidders were then dismissed and told that Brookstone would be in contact with the committee's selection within a few days to present at the upcoming board meeting this evening. The following is my understanding of the communication to our sales agency from the three key players on the committee for the project and timeline in their own summary. Brookstone. It has been decided to go with Extra Light because Orion's labor was too low and was a concern, along with other fixtures, was light better. Conroe ISD. K&L facilities labor was too low and hence considered risky due to bond rate of over 3.5% for an assumed calculation. Stated it was a red flag because we did not have a traditional housing and just attaching a traditional housing over a fixture would create a heat concern. In response to these concerns, Conroe ISD will reconsider the K&L proposal, Orion Energy Systems Inc., a publicly traded company with a bond rating of 1.125%, will provide installation services directly for the Conroe ISD project. This will address the concerns about the installation as Orion has successfully completed over 10,000 projects in project installs. The proposed Orion solution is UL listed, specifically meets the criteria for attachment to a traditional housing, and even with this configuration, the LM79 certification rates the life of 187,000 hours. This was the superior performance of the Orion product, 21% more efficient, compared to the extra light product, 40 watts versus 45 watts, will generate approximately 26,159 annually and savings over the extra light fixture. We have an attached documentation that I can present as well. Given that it appears all requirements were met by K&L facility advisors on the alternate fixture schedule with our industry-leading 
line of Orion Technology, and Orion has provided a bond rate of 1.125% as presented in this letter, you should be comfortable in proceeding with a K&L bid. A solution that is $617,000 lower, the upfront savings and the estimated $26,159 annual energy savings will provide a significant enhancement to your capital and energy budget this year and for years to come. Why would the Conroe ISD purposely choose a more expensive product that is less efficient when a superior product can be installed by a world-class company that is fully bonded with resources to support 100% success? I will also add, in my own words, there is a potential of savings of an additional $306,940 that has not been discussed. 15,347 fixture schedules, as Orion had to add $20 per fixture to it for an unnecessary housing the taxpayers already purchased years prior and can be reused versus disposed of wastefully without implica implications to the specified performance criteria. In conclusion, if the board can recommend a continuance in special meeting, I believe the correct decision will be made for the taxpayers of the district. 619,000 plus 306,000 of 26,000 over 10 years minimum uh, annually in energy reduction equals 1.18 uh, $1,186,350.70. I urge the board to be fiscally responsible for their district's citizens. Thank you. Taylor Cap. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. You, um, item three, uh, the consent agenda. You've had this for a week. I uh, heard no uh, request to remove an item. So I would entertain a bid. A, a motion. A motion. And a second. A second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like sign. This is unanimously. Item 4A, Dr. Stockton, uh, approve uh, school mascots for Patterson Elementary and Stewart. I'm sorry. I apologize. Moving, I'm going to move item 8A up. Uh, that is the human resource report uh, naming of principal for Austin Elementary. Dr. Scott, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Husbands. It's always my pleasure to bring rep uh, recommendations for principals to the board for, for your consideration. I'm very excited to um, recommend a person that will be new to us. Um, I'd like to recommend Dr. Serena Pearson for the principal position of Austin Elementary School. Motion. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Any discussion? Therefore, everybody signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, like sign. Congratulations. Good evening, Mr. Husbands, Dr. Stockton, and the Board of Trustees. I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to join the Conroe ISD family. I am excited to serve the students, staff, and community of Austin Elementary. Here supporting me tonight is my husband, David Pearson. You would stand. And I also have a 13-year-old son who decided on a water balloon fight with his friends over I don't so, Lost that battle, but thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations. Welcome to CIC. Congratulations. Tell your son hello. Absolutely. Hope you Wednesday. Right. Right. Item, item 4A, Dr. Stockton, approval of school mascots for Patterson and Stewart Elementaries. Okay, we're back again this month for your approval for the mascots for Patterson Elementary and Stewart Elementary. And I'll ask Dr. Gibson to present that item again. Good evening, Mr. Husband's board members and Dr. Stockton. Uh, we are seeking your approval this evening for the nominations for our campus mascots for Charlie Patterson Elementary and Gene Stewart Elementary. We presented these mascots in May. Uh, the Patterson Elementary Pumas and the Stewart Elementary Mustangs. We're seeking your approval at this time. I have a motion. 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 Second. 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 Oh, very good. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by raising your right hand. 
All opposed, like sign. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Dr. Gibson. And congratulations, Dr. Stewart and Mr. Patterson. Yeah. Item 4B, uh, LED lighting retrofit project. Dr. Stockton. I'll ask Easy Foster to come to the podium to present that item. <clears throat> Mr. Husbands, Dr. Stockton, members, it's my pleasure tonight to bring forward for, you, for your approval a guaranteed maximum price for a lighting retrofit project. The proposal for the lighting retrofit project was advertised twice according to our procurement guidelines. Uh, competitive seal proposals were accepted by Brookstone Construction, our construction manager at risk. After receiving the proposals, we've Verification of the pricing specs, the proposed cost for the project came to $4,342,433. Funds for this project have been allocated in the general fund. The, the purpose of this project is to replace aging T12 fluorescent fixtures with LED light fixtures. T12 components are being phased out of production, and as these fixtures fail, our district has a choice to retrofit with either T8 fluorescent ballast and lamps or go with an LED option. A full fixture LED option has been selected based on extensive research, full-scale mock-ups, uh, engineering input, and return on investment calculations. It's important to note that the return on investment calculation based on the GMP here is 3.8 years. This project includes approximately 17,500 fixtures, and the end result will yield a significant energy savings, decreased life cycle cost because the fixtures we're proposing and as well, all the fixtures that we took proposals on included a 10-year parts and labor warranty. The project also adds user adjustable lighting controls at the affected classroom cam campus locations. At this time, I would like to ask for your approval for this project. Okay. Um, I hear a motion. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to make a motion so we can. We, discuss we do it. need a motion to discuss in a second. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion, Dr. Brown? Uh, yes, I'd like for easy to uh, to answer or respond to the issues raised by, by our person, Mr. Kelp. 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 I'd be happy to uh, address uh, some specific decision-making criteria. Okay. Because um, I wasn't taking notes while he was, okay. he was reading, so. Uh, but we, we we did go through an extensive process, and I brought my engineering team uh, today to help talk about some more technical details if we get we get that deep. But we we have mock-ups at Conroe High School from several manufacturers. Uh, Orion is one of the manufacturers represented uh, at Conroe High School. The the lighting as it's installed over there, when you compare manufacturer to manufacturer, just as an impression walking in the room. From our main staff, which includes uh, Marshall and his group, uh, my staff, our engineering staff, and people that walked in the room, the preference was not for the Orion fixture, just on normal perception. Um, I'll let my engineers talk about the technical differences between the light fixtures because it, it can get pretty deep in the weeds. Um, on bid day, I mean, because on June 5th, the day that he said we, uh, we collected bids in, in Brookstone's office, and it, it is important to note that the guidelines that we procure construction with require us to make decisions on the information provided at the time the public bid was opened. The bonding rate that he mentioned from Orion directly was given to us after the bid, not during the bid. The bid rate that he mentioned, the 3.5% calculation, was the bid he turned in, in in his competitive seal proposal. Their labor rate, the labor, and it's important to note there's many moving parts in a project such as this. Uh, the labor that he had elected is the installation of the fixtures and the occupancy sensors and the dimming controls themselves. We had three manufacturers bring three installers to the table. All three manufacturers on the, uh, on the fixture themselves uh, were priced in a competitive fashion. The fixture that was that the whole program was designed around, which is a manufacturer that we're very familiar with, and we use their fixtures in our district now, came in the highest. Extra light was in the middle. Our extra light was the lowest priced fixture, and Orion was in the middle on the fixture price. The installation price is the difference in the in the in the bids. Pinnacle are designed 
the manufacturer that everything was designed around and extra light are very close to each other in their installation price. Right at uh, just a hair over a million dollars in installation. Orion's installation costs they presented on bid day were under $500,000 with a, a called out value for their performance payment bond. When we did the math on the called out value of their performance payment bond, it put their bonding rate at three and a half percent, which from a c contractor perspective, anything over 2% is called into question. Right. Extra Light's bonding rate was given to us as a percentage rate at one and three quarters percent and uh, Pinnacle was at 2.5%. So on the data we had on the day the bids were opened is the decision that is where we made the decision. The, the risk at <coughs> an installer that is half of what his competitors are actually more than less than half of what his competition was calls into its own question. Do they have the entire scope? Uh, even if they were to supply a bond, I, I still question it. Do they have the entire scope? Clearly something is different. So based on uh, choosing the least expensive fixture with a competitive install rate at a favorable bonding rate is how we arrived at the decision we made. Okay. And, and after all this, you're still pretty comfortable with, with the decision? <clears throat> uh, we are absolutely comfortable with the decision. Extra Light is a company that's been doing projects like this for schools, uh, for colleges, and they've been doing doing business in and out of Houston for over 28 years. They have the longevity to uh, attest to the 10-year parts and labor warranty as well as stand by their installation. How long has Mr. Kelp's company been in business? Uh, I don't. 96, I believe. The paperwork that I've 96? Got, well, Orion has been involved in 96, I believe. How long is? 18 years. Um, I mean, I, I can't speak how long k &L Facility Advisors has been in business. Well, can we, can we uh, have the <coughs> engineer to speak briefly? Sure. Um, Brian? Hey, can we both, <coughs> go ahead. You, you just stay up there, though. Let, let me make sure I, I have some more questions. questions. Yeah, one second. Sure. Easy. So uh, the fixture itself, the light, I guess the actual parts were pretty competitive or mid, it was mid-level. Well, um, they were. it's the labor that causes us the heart. Labor burn. is the giant differential. Okay. Okay. In your Let opinion, me digest is, that. Go ahead. I'm, go ahead in, in your opinion, is there any drawback to using the old fixture versus the new? Just independent of everything else, is there any drawback to that? Or is there rust on them? Or are they going to wear out sooner? I mean, I, 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 and that, that was the you're, housing, right? You're, the housing. Yeah, you're stripping all the ballast off, right? I mean, all that's history, right? Well, the um, the way the the way the Orion fixture is installed, the ballast doesn't necessarily have to come out of the housing. It, it can remain because their their system fits in. Fits in. Yes. Okay. So, in your opinion, is there any drawback to using? The, uh, and if this is an engineering question, forgive me. But if it's not, is it? Is there any drawback to using the existing uh, fixture versus a new one? Well, I can speak from a layman's point of view, but I'd, I'd like to have an engineer input to answer that. That's fair. That's fair. Now, that one, one other thing, you know, in in the in the bond in the bid bond business, Certainly. okay, if there is a a difference in in bid of more than a certain percent, they they get a bid tab and they have to report back the winner if they're lower than by a certain amount, okay, and and all you're doing is judging people based upon that same situation. So what you're saying, in essence, is you had concerns that they could finish the job for the amount that they quoted. Correct. Okay, thank you. And Brian, if you wouldn't mind, we'll, we can address the pictures here. Um, the, the team that's coming up now is uh, Brian Jenkins, who's a partner with DBR Engineering, the engineering firm that designed the, uh, the uh, plans that we took bids on. And he's got with him one of his uh, associates, the design uh, engineer, uh, Adam Jones. So this would be Brian Jenkins. Okay, thank you. Hi, Brian. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. The, uh, the fixture that we're talking about, we actually specified a actually brand new fixture. What has been submitted is a retrofit type fixture, meaning that's why he had brought up about using the existing housing and coming in with a retrofit. They do a lot of retrofits. Um, all over the country, but what we got with the maintenance, we reviewed that type of fixture, and it was uh, decided to go with a brand new fixture. 
So in our opinion, the retrofit fixture is not even equal to the other two that were uh, submitted on. Okay. Um, if we were wanting to go just with the retrofit, and that's what maintenance and facilities was looking for, we would have had different competition for them. Something that's very similar. The uh, fixtures that uh, the fixtures they submitted is not equal, in our opinion, to the fixtures that uh, we have on our documents. Just like well, briefly, what are advantages and disadvantages of retrofit? Versus retrofit is a much quicker installation. Okay. Uh, you're not getting a new fixture. You're getting a retrofit kit, which attaches to the bottom of the fixture. So for them to make it a fixture, they decided to go ahead and supply a housing um, to, to make it like a fixture, but you still have the retrofit kit with the housing is two components, not just one. You get a fixture, there's one component. In the, in the retrofit, there's two, a housing and a kit. And what does the one buy you that the two doesn't? Or what does it buy you? Well, what we're concerned with, with the maintenance is uh, you're trapping the heat between the housing and this kit. Um, the components are mounted above, they have aluminum on the top, and then you have a steel housing. In between that, you're, you're getting heat. That's what our concern was. And what, we were what, also very those concerns, what are they? Are they safety concerns? Are they energy we were, concerns? We're uh, concerned about the length of lifetime. I thought there was a warrant associated with it. There's a 10-year parts and labor. But even though it's a 10-year parts and labor, these fixtures are designed we'll to outlast 10 years. It, I mean, way, way beyond. 20 years at least. Right. And so the 10-year warranty... You're saying, you know, so they, they're under warranty for 10, but it might affect the 10 to 20 year period because That's of this correct. heat trap? Okay. That's correct. Well, makes sense. Or, mm -hmm. So is this a million dollars? I mean, is, is 600000 $600, Yeah, and we're also, like Easy had mentioned, very concerned about the labor rate. We want to make sure they have it in their documents. Uh, it came to about, I believe, $20 a fixture. And not only do we have the fixtures being changed out, We've got dimming controls and occupancy sensors in each of the classrooms. There, so there's a lot more than just changing out a fixture. Okay, but one last question. You you had earlier said it's a much easier retro. If okay. you're going to retro. And, and so is that a partial explanation for their difference in labor? That might have been what they priced, but that's not what, what's on our document. Well, okay. And then the second part of the question would be, you said that the competition would have changed. Uh, you know, instead of the two companies offsetting the the bid here you know, right. or, or the, the three companies that bid you would have them with two or three other companies that happen to do retro do the same exact thing but you made the decision it, it did not fit specs correct okay oh, oh my. correct we we actually um we called out for a pinnacle uh lighting and also the extra light we did not have in the specification that the orion fixture wasn't equal uh, they submitted the price. We evaluated it. I'm going to ask you to speculate here. Assuming that there would have been an apples to apples bid there, do you think the pricing would have been uh, how far out of the water do you think uh, Orion's product would have been? Would they have been just as competitive? Is that what we're assuming here? Well, because they're comparing. Well, I mean, totally. On <clears throat> when you're when you're talking, if, if if the fixtures weren't part of the equation, if everybody was apples to apples, is your question? I, I would yes. Ask. And it was just based on the labor rate. We, we, we would have three bidders, two of them relatively competitive with each other, one of them 50% plus lower than the other two. Wow. And that's what Mr. Husbands was speaking to in the bonding, uh, bid bond performance category. You have to, that one calls himself out as an anomaly uh, and would be suspect. And let me just go one step further. If it's too far, the bond company won't provide the performance bond. But I'm not saying that it is. I'm right. just saying if that distance is too far, they'll refuse to bond the job. That, yeah. That's how important it is. Correct. I mean, so generally speaking, if it's more than 10% difference, we start to really dig in and ask questions. At this point, we're greater than 50% difference on that scope. I'd like to hear. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. I've got. Go ahead. I'd like to hear Mr. Kelp's rebuttal to that. Those arguments. Well, I, I would like to point out, too, any rebuttal that he's got at this point is information received after the bid date. Fair enough. Which, I mean, by by our state laws, I can't. Okay, well, then you're, you are at my question, then. Did they meet the specs for the bid? 
they did not. Scouts group meet the specs for the bid. Their bid would have been, if there were no, if all things were equal, their bid would have only been accepted as a voluntary alternate. It was not a designed and pre-approved substitution to our specification. And now that we have it, and I'm perfectly comfortable that it doesn't meet specs, okay? I got that. But now that we've seen it, and now that we know there's $600,000 sitting on the table, okay, just to be perfectly clear, and it ain't a matter of pride, okay, are we comfortable sticking with our original, I mean, we've already made that decision not to go with a retrofit. Are we still comfortable with making that, with that decision? And I mean across the, you know, from Ian to Marshall to you to whoever's on the committee. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because the project is more complicated than just swapping out two-by-four light fixtures. Take the Woodlands High School, for instance. There's approximately 2,000 fixtures in the Woodlands High School. A majority of those fixtures are one-by-four light fixtures. So to put in a two-by-four fixture in its place requires some additional time and effort, work effort. I can't speak to whether or not their installer picked those type of details up, but 2,000 fixtures that require additional time and effort may be the difference in their bid price. Okay, but let me come back to it. Yes, sir. Okay, regardless of the labor, let's just say we threw everything out and started over again tomorrow, and I'm not insinuating that we should or could. I'm asking you. No, I would like to. All things considered. All things considered. Do we need to stay with the new fixture, or should we look at retrofits again? For the needs of our district and with the input of our maintenance department, which Marshall's nodding his head in affirmation, we would absolutely make the decision to put in a new fixture in this type of situation. Thank you. Any other questions, gentlemen? I'd still like to, if it's all the same with the board. Is it really not appropriate to have engaged in a debate? You know, I mean, he's presenting the facts. If you all would like additional information, we could, you know, table the item and get the information to you, but it isn't. I didn't think so. So, anyway, any other discussion? Just real quick, you were saying that Marshall over there is nodding his head in agreement. Just can we hear from him as well? Certainly. As to what? I agree. Well, with the same, all the circumstances, I would still make the decision to go with a new fixture. I think there is a consideration for the heat load. Although there's a 10-year warranty, labor and parts and labor warranty, we spoke with a 20-year. The LED fixture itself, there's two parts. There's the LED bulb itself, and then there's a driver. The LED portion is what's going to take the hit for the additional heat that's built up into that fixture. The new fixture is designed to dissipate that heat through the top of the fixture. Very good. Thank you. Mrs. Powell, kid. Okay, we have a motion, and we have a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Okay. For all those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like sign. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And I would just like to point out, I do appreciate the tough questions. So, thanks. We'll keep asking. Careful what you ask for. All right. Item 4C, Dr. Stockton, bond referendum update. It's a good chance for some tough questions now. Bond update, Mr. Foster. Well, we have taken the liberty to rename this segment capital improvement updates. We're starting to get into projects that we've allocated from fund balance rather than 2008 bond referendum money. So, rather than lump them all as bond improvements, these are capital improvements. So, starting with what we've got going on at Oak Ridge 9th grade campus. This, if you'll recall, we've approved the GMP to add 12 classrooms or 4 lab spaces at this, or 10 classrooms and 4 lab spaces at this campus. As you can see right now, we've started the interior demolition for the summer critical projects. So, don't go in there today. That being said, the summer critical area is to get the cafeteria expansion done so that we can house more student population and feed them in a timely manner. 
Uh, and then they're working through the front of the admin doing an admin re reconfiguration so we get ready to change the front door appearance of that campus. Uh, those things are happening this summer so that we can get prepared to do uh, do the major structures over the course of the school year. You said appearance, but it's really safety, right? Well, safety I mean, is a factor, it, but, but we are giving... I mean, it will yes. look different. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, we're giving uh, Oak Ridge ninth grade campus uh, an identity other than just a brick box. Moving forward to the Oak Ridge School Road Improvement. As you'll recall, this project is improving Oak Ridge School Road starting at Interstate 45 and winding through the Oak Ridge campus back to Hauser Elementary. What you're looking at here is the first boulevard pavement section that is uh, now concrete. Uh, it should have opened for traffic this afternoon. So the boulevard section on the other side as you enter Oak Ridge Elementary is, uh, is being demolished now. Within a couple weeks, that, that campus should be restored to full traffic. Uh, they are moving around the, uh, if you recall, the front of Oak Ridge Elementary was asphalt. So they're replacing all that asphalt with concrete and they're making their way towards the, the clinic entrance side of it now. So within two weeks, we should have unencumbered access through the appropriate direction through the railways. Uh, right now, they're in a detour direction to get to the clinic. This is a shot looking down towards the Oak Ridge ninth grade uh, where that asphalt roadway has been removed. And then over the next couple of weeks, you will see approximately 35% or so of the uh, widening paving being placed. There's formwork and steel in place for most of that roadway now. At Vogel Intermediate, we are adding eight classrooms there. You're looking at a picture here of the uh, building underground where the building pad is currently in. These pictures were taken last week. So the building pad is in place, the underground utilities are in place, uh, the foundation drilled and underream foundations are in place now. Uh, what you're looking at are the preparations for the concrete pour to do the fire lane improvement uh, for fire truck access to the back of the school and the building slab for the classroom addition. At Knox Junior High, we still haven't painted the van yet, but uh, Knox is entering its summer phases of work so that the crews are spread throughout that building now. It is progressing as scheduled. Uh, we are into phase eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 of a 12 phase project. Uh, so that is going on this summer. As, as you know, along with Knox, we're doing various chiller replacements, chiller upgrades. The, the work for Candy Creek High School is underway now, uh, replacing two chillers at Candy Creek High School. And then at McCullough, they've started working on the uh, air conditioning upgrades and the lighting retrofit to the uh, Bach Auditorium. So we're in the process of changing uh, the Bach Auditorium house lighting from the uh, original installation uh, to uh, an LED fixture. In the end. That is separate from the LED project that was just approved a moment ago. That Knox project is uh, on schedule and all those projects are, are scheduled to be open uh, before school starts in the fall. The multi-campus front door or front entry security upgrade which was approved at the board meeting last month. Uh, what you're seeing here is a representation of all. We're affecting the front doors of 24 campuses. This is at D. Singer Elementary School. You'll see what you'll see is uh, a representation of at the front door of each school moving up, you'll see a call box and a card reader on the right-hand side of the door at each of the schools that are being affected. At this point, half of the 24 campuses have been wired. They are going back now to those first half and installing all the hardware to go with the wiring. So uh, if the schedule holds the way it appears to be holding, we should be doing our pre-functional testing on these door fronts well before school starts. So we should be able to, we should have the option to go live or do a, a, a scaled rollout of these campuses as, as the time school begins for the fall. The multi-campus skylight project, which affects um, David, Anderson, V. Singer, um, and campuses of that vintage, you can see we are eliminating the skylights down the hallways, down the great hallways, and then the skylights over the, over the main part of the library and the gymnasium in those, in those buildings. You can see from the inside, uh, this, this isn't a finished product, but this is a midstream finish, so we've got a good hard ceiling. The next step of this project is in improving the lighting in those areas so that we don't have the dark spots. At Travis Intermediate, you recall this one, we are replacing the exterior masonry on the two oldest structures there. Uh, the pictures now will show you masonry going up the side of the uh, auditoriums. They're, they're moving, those will be complete very soon. And the, the demolition crews are now on the back side of that building working over on the library section. 
then the next couple of weeks they will be back around the front side working uh, along uh, the facade along the storefront. That project is moving uh, as we planned. Um, even with the rain we've had recently, they, they've been able to make up their time. Um, this is just a shot of that same, uh, the inside of the auditorium, so where we've got everything braced up from the inside. And that are the, those are the major projects we have on the construction currently. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Questions of Foster? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item 5A, Dr. Stockton, uh, preliminary 2014-15 proposed budget. Okay, at this time I'm going to ask Dan Cox, our Chief Financial Officer, to come present the preliminary 2014-2015 proposed budget. Mr. Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, I'm pleased to present the preliminary budget information for the 2014-2015 budget. Uh, the theme of this year's budget uh, is that we is providing a strong foundation for education and growth. Uh, we find ourselves in a position to, uh, we think, strengthen our, our foundation of our school and uh, uh, be better prepared for not only this coming year but future years after that. The uh, first thing that I want to talk about is uh, the certified property values, uh, uh, we have a uh, an amazing uh, increase in property values this year. Uh, you can see here that we're currently use projecting a $3 billion increase in assessed values. This is about 12.5%. Uh, we, we, we do not have the final numbers, but uh, we could actually even see a, a, some slight increase over this. But uh, this is both a good and a bad situation. Uh, it is going to uh, result in a significant uh, increase in revenues this coming year, but it brings back into play something that we haven't really had to deal with for a number of years, and that's the Robin Hood effect. And I'm going to talk more about that later in the presentation because it's something that we really need to keep in mind as we look at this year's budget. Uh, we've the Robin Hood effect has been somewhat masked ever since the, the legislature restructured school funding in 2007 and put in place target revenue. And then a few years ago, they, they reinstituted the funding that they had cut a few years prior to that. Both of those items together really took the Robin Hood effect out of play. But it is now back in, in play 100%. And with an increase like this, it puts us in a position of seeing a big impact the, f the year after that. And I'll talk more about that later, but, but we, as we look at this budget, we need to keep in mind that uh, Robin Hood effect is back in play. And, and I'm going to talk more about that and explain it as I go through here. Uh, <clears throat> but obviously, assessed values are up, which is going to have a very positive effect in this coming year. Uh, attendance, another the other key driver of our funding. Uh, once again, for the second or third year in a row, we're projecting 1,100. Uh, you can see that we have been trending slightly down the last few years, but we really think that's that situation is bottoming, and uh, we could see a turnaround uh, in in enrollment, both either this year or the in in the next few years. So. We think that we're probably at the low point right now, uh, but we are using 1100 for our budget uh, and expect uh, uh, that to be a solid number. As we uh, approached our budgeting, we developed uh, specific objectives for this year's budget, the 14-15 budget. One was to meet the needs uh, for the 2014-2015 school year. We wanted to provide a strong salary increase for CISD employees. We wanted to provide a tax decrease, tax rate decrease for our CISD patrons. And then, as I mentioned before, we want to preserve funding for the 2015-16 budget because there will be a Robin Hood effect. We don't know exactly what, what it'll be at this time, but we do know there'll be a Robin Hood effect. And I'll talk more about that as I go. Looking at the 2014-15 funding estimate, 
Uh, as I said, we're going to see a substantial increase in revenue in this first year. Uh, we're looking at a, a projected revenue increase of $47.8 million. That's coming from the $17 million surplus that we have in the current year, which I want to point out we, we preserved, we used the, the, one, the, the, the current year surplus to build the ninth grade, Oak Ridge ninth grade expansion out of cash rather than use bond debt. <laughs> uh, and then that money is available to us again in this coming year. So that money is not going away because it has not been impacted by the Robin Hood effect. In addition, uh, because of the increased assessed value, we're seeing an additional revenue for uh, 27.3 million coming from the 12.5% AV increase and the 1100 AD increase, uh, ADA. And then the state has instituted a new 1.5% contribution to TRS to really address the underfunded pension issues. So they're increasing the contribution. This year, the state is uh, is funding that. So they're providing the funding for that as well. Going forward, they've made no commitment to, to provide that funding. I personally think they will provide it going forward, but we don't know that today. So as we look forward, we can't be assured that that funding will be there. Uh, so all together, all added all together, we're looking at a, a $47.8 million increase in revenue this year. So a very strong funding position in 14-15. We talked about uh, our, one of our goals in this budget was to give a strong salary increase to our employees. We think we've done that. Our teacher salaries, which have already been approved. Uh, we have a starting salary of 48700 which is very competitive. Uh, and we also are giving an $1,840 increase to all teachers. Uh, we feel good about teacher salary situation. We think this is very competitive. Obviously, 88% of our budget is, is people, salaries, and benefits. Uh, so people uh, additions and salary increases represent the biggest part of our budget changes. The first line that you see here, these are all our personnel additions. The first line represents what we would normally see in 1100 uh, student growth year. Uh, the number of professionals, teachers, and other professionals, paras that we'd add. This is 7.8 million. Below that, you see program additions, which are things that we talked about in our budget workshop. These are specific program areas where we saw understaffed situations that we needed to beef up to not only deal with the coming year, but to deal with future growth as well. Uh, and so these are the additions that we have talked about and they put into our budget. Uh, together, these, uh, these results, these uh, add up to 185.5 positions and a total of $9.3 million. More detail. Uh, the $7.8 million uh, listed above at campuses for student growth. That detail is presented on this slide. Uh, you can see that uh, we have already begun the process and in many cases hired the 87 and a half teachers uh, at the campuses. Uh, we also have in there 19 teaching contingency positions which will not be filled until the students are there and the need is, is clear that we need those. So we don't hire all of those teachers at, at the beginning. We, we reserve these 19 positions, but I was, I'm confident that if we get the 1,100 students, they'll be filled. Uh, <clears throat> other professionals are counselors, librarians, and nurses. Then we have paras, 20 and a half paras, administrators, for a total of 150 positions in that uh, uh, in that, at the campus level. In other expenses, again, what we just looked at were some pretty significant increases in both salary, salary increases and, and uh, personnel additions. You get into other expenses and the numbers aren't that big because, again, 88% of our budget is salary and benefits. Uh, we have put in a 300,000 increase for utilities. We have seen 
Uh, we've gone for a number of years where we've been reducing utility costs. Even though we've been adding square footage, we've been bringing utility costs down. But we're seeing that turn around now. Uh, we are seeing rate increases uh, for both water and electricity. So we put, uh, we are projecting 300,000 increase in utilities. Uh, we have MCAD fees. Actually, uh, Mr. Castleshoot is here tonight. Uh, Mark, are you? Wave way at us here. <laughs> Mark is uh, Mark Castleshoot from the appraisal district is here tonight uh, to talk to us about another issue. Uh, but uh, they have, uh, as you see from the appraisals, uh, uh, their business, their activity has increased dramatically, and they have uh, some additional costs as well. And this is our allocated share of their budget, which we we fund. Uh, we have supply. Uh, Supplies at the campus. Uh, this is primarily related to the two new schools that we're opening, but it also includes some allocations to the other schools as well. A fuel, 175,000. Innovative program grants. This is in-house grants for innovative classroom ideas. Uh, this is a program that we uh, preserve reserve money for funding of good ideas in the classroom that we hope generate. Uh, innovative ideas that can go across the, the, the district. Uh, we have some so projected software purchases. The first one is learning management system, which facilitates online education and assignments. And the second is uh, a concept of uh, safety alert software that will allow our employees to quickly uh, uh, connect with the police dispatch in cases of emergency. Uh, we're evaluating those options, but we have reserved that in the in, in the budget. Uh, and finally, miscellaneous things: insurance, copier, rental, and other things. For a total of one million seven hundred forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars for other expenses. Summing all these up, uh, we're looking at uh, preliminary projection of budget increases: a three and a half percent salary increase across the board is ten point two million. Personnel growth, we looked at that for 1,100 students is 7.8 million. Personnel for program additions is 1.5 million. Uh, we're increasing our funding to the health fund pro uh, program by a million dollars. And I'm, this has been a real positive thing this year. We've seen an improvement in our health fund. We've, we've completely overhauled our health plan program going forward. We. I think this has been a successful story this year. We're going to actually see, in most cases, our employees' call health care costs, their, their premiums are going to drop when, when many districts are seeing increases in this area. Uh, we, are, uh, we're, we are going upping our contribution by a million dollars, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that things are going to go well going forward. We think we're going to have a good program, and we think it's going to be very cost-effective. Uh, then we have the 1.5% TRS contribution. Again, uh, we, we won't know until next year whether it's going to be funded in the future by, by the state or by us, but if it is a cost increase this year. And then the other expenses of $1.7 million that we just talked about for a total of $25.8 million increase. Uh, our projected budget. We see on the revenue side, uh, in addition to the 17 million surplus we uh, had, uh, we have in the current year, we're adding another 30.8 million. So our revenues are 416.9 million. Uh, last year's budget was 369.1. We're proposing a 3.5 percent salary increase of 10.2 million. Other expenses of 15.6 million that we just went through uh, for a budget of 394.9 million. This leaves us with a surplus of 22 million in the current year. Now, because I'm, again, I'm going to go through this uh, 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 Robin Hood effect, but because of the potential, the uncertainty of the coming year of the next year budget and revenue, we're proposing that we. We save this money in the general fund in case we have to access it in the following year. 
But looking at the budget increase, including the 3.5 million TRS contribution, it's it's a 7% budget increase. If you back that out, it's 22.3 million or 6%. Uh, if you look at our budget over the last four years, you can see that our budget has grown 16.1% for a four-year average of 4% a year. Uh, compared to student growth, which is average 2.4, and inflation, which is average 2.1. So this is a combined 4.5%. So we've averaged 4% growth uh, over the last four years, while student growth and inflation have averaged 4.5% growth combined. And, and we are wanting to keep below that uh, over, on the, over an extended period of time. Uh, <clears throat> If you look at the four-year average budget increase, it's been approximately $14 million. It's large this year. Uh, we're in position to do it. But uh, if you look at it over an elapsed period of time, it's a, a reasonable number. Uh, I talked about the Robin Hood effect. The, uh, this is my effort to explain that. Uh, <laughs> the, there's... The general public generally doesn't get, doesn't understand how this works. Uh, they assume that when, when our local assessed values go up and our local taxes go up, the school district ha gets that money forever going forward. Well, we do get it the first year, but the next year it becomes a benefit to the state and not us. And I'll show you how this works. These are actual numbers. Our current year 2013-2014 budget, our assessed value is 23.9 billion. That generates local revenue of 236.8 million. Now we also have state revenue coming in, and there, that's also a, a misunderstanding. Most most people think that Conroe ISD is a rich district. We are not a rich district. Uh, we, and, and the reason, we have a lot of wealth in our district, no question, but we've got 55,000 students. And the way wealth is calculated is it's wealth per student. It's not how much wealth you have, it's how much you have per student. And because we have so many students, we're not considered a wealthy district. Uh, <clears throat> so we still get state funding, but uh, I'm not gonna look at state funding this year, I am, you know, the next year, though, but I wanted to show you that that 230, that, that 23.9 billion generates local revenue of 236.8 million. Now, <clears throat> if we go to the this next year, 2014-2015, we saw earlier that our assessed value went up three billion dollars. That generates local revenue of 268 million. However, the state calculates their funding for the 2014-15 year off of our prior year assessed value. So they assume that our assessed value is lower, $3 billion lower. Therefore, they give us more money. They give us $148 million. So we're projecting uh, revenue, state revenue next year of $148 million for a total revenue of $416 million. Now, <coughs> freeze everything there and assume in 2015-16 there is no change in enrollment, no change in AV, and, th and these are not going to happen. These things are not going to happen, but to see the effect of the Robin Hood, you freeze it, and, and also assume that there's no change in the state funding formula. There's no, uh, there's no change in the basic allotment. Or everything stays the same. You look at 2015-16 to see what would happen. Well, we get the same local revenue of 268 million, but all of a sudden the state revenue drops to 116.8 million because now it's based off of 26.9 billion assessed value. Uh, and all of a sudden, so our 416 revenue drops to 385 million. The state picks up that 31.2 million, so that that big surge that we're getting this coming year is now transferred to the state. And they have that, those funds become state funds which are available to, for them to spend however. You know, they would, that, that's where they redistribute the funding at that point. 
Uh, now, granted, uh, I'm not suggesting in any way that there's that we're not going to see increases in AV next year, that we're not going to see increases in enrollment, or there won't be changes to the, the, the state funding formula. There will be changes. The state uh, is almost obligated to adjust the basic allotment every year because that's how districts that aren't benefiting from, from enrollment growth and AV growth, that's where they get the funding to give a salary increase. Or to do, they may not hire anybody, but, but they still have to keep up with inflation. And so there will be changes in the, in the funding formula. There will be AV growth. We don't know how much. Now, I will tell you that to the extent that AV doesn't grow at least 12.5%, we're going to see some, and, and I don't think it will grow 12 and a half percent. I think this was a, an anomaly this year. To the extent that it grows less than 12 and a half percent, there will be some Robin Hood effect to us. So we won't be able to know it, what our funding will be until we get through this legislative session that's coming up, till we see what our AV is, till we project a new enrollment figure. Those are important things. Uh, so what I'm proposing to do with this $22 million surplus this year is essentially put it in the bank, uh, preserve that funding in case we have a situation where we don't, where we are, we do start to see a, a significant potential reduction in our funding uh, next year versus this year because of the Robin Hood effect. And I put a note in there that uh, the 2015 Texas legislative session and next year's AV growth, along with enrollment growth, will determine what our funding is. And I think all three of those will be up. It's just, and so we're, we're going to see some growth in funding. Or not, not necessarily growth in funding, we're going to see growth in these areas, which will reduce that $31 million that's being taken away. Now, it's a question of how much it reduces it, is will determine how much funding we have available to us. But if we've got this $22 million in the bank, we, we should be able to work through it under any scenario. Yeah, John. So, Mr. Cox, if, if you if you had your 1,100 student growth annually, okay, mm -hmm. what would that 31 become? I know you've looked at it. Well, the, 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 the basic uh, allotment now is about $5,600 a student. So, so that's six million bucks right there. Okay. So if we get eleven hundred, we get six million of that thirty-one back. And and that's without any growth. I mean, that's right. Which, right. which is and, and, and we is will get five at a minimum. Oh, uh, well, yeah. high, you yeah. know, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I think I think five, three, five, six percent is a, is probably a and, reasonable range. And five percent of that is worth what? Uh, that's five percent would be like thirteen million. Thank you. So, I had a, just a general question. I understand we're, what you're saying is we're blessed to have wealth in our district, in our community. But as far as a district, we're not necessarily considered a wealthy district exactly. because we have so many students. Mm -hmm. Percentage-wise, where, where do we where do we fall? Are we in the middle, or are we? What, we're, we we have been moving up the scale. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, we we do fall into the definition of the first tier of wealthy districts, but it's we're nowhere near the level where we send money to the state, uh, and we probably never will get there. Uh, Just given our, our population, our student yeah, population. Exactly, yeah. Uh, but so, so <clears throat> by one definition, we are considered wealthy, but by the one that counts, where you <laughs> when you have to start sending money, we're not anywhere near there. Most, and, and we won't be. most people think of the Robin Hood effect as those districts who are sending money back to the state. Where it hits us is in the next year funding when it's reduced based on AV. So, yeah. yeah, our budget keeps going up, but the state funding keeps going down because we're paying a bigger share of it every year uh, because of our wealth growth. But we're still relying on state funding. And, you know, for them to reduce their funding, potentially $31 million in one year is a huh? big hit. Now, that's not going to happen because of these factors we just talked about. But we have to understand that 
that it's probably not going to be 12 and a half percent increase next year. And for us to get all 31 million back, we'd have to. Yeah, it might be 16. <laughs> well, it might be. I don't know. What do you think about that, Mr. Castleshoot? No comment. <laughs> I have a question Just for a you. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, we talked at a couple of meetings before about um, the increase for our non-professional employees. Yes. And I didn't hear anything in this report about that, but I had spoken to you after the meeting and you assured me that it, you guys were considering it, it, it's that. It's in there. So where did, where did I miss it? Could you? Well, we, we, there are, uh, I just didn't talk about it. It's a nominal number. But, sure. But there, we to, to us it's nominal, but not to the people <laughs> who it affects. So I would really like to hear a little bit more about it. Well, the things, I don't, the 4%, we, we put a minimum 4% in for, uh, uh, I for all the campus pairs, I believe. Is, is that what we did? All pair professional. Yeah, all pairs got 4%. Got 4%. Yeah, but okay. I didn't really. That's so okay. I just wanted to, it's, I, definitely, it's definitely something I'm passionate about, so I wanted to hear it from you uh, on the record. It's there. I <laughs> Thank you. Haven't taken it out. I assume the same for the um, police officers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a special adjustment. That, that was done uh, by, actually, I guess, Tansby yes. did yes. that. Yeah. Police department. I was struggling with your terminology, Robin Hood. We're not giving anything back. They're reducing them out to giving them. Well, yeah, but it, the, the point. Money it, gone. Well, you, no. you, the reality no. is, Less, is it's it. low. The, we're not getting the benefit of that increase from in local revenue, is what I'm saying. Well, and, uh, but the people, the perception of the general public is we, get all, we keep all that. We keep it for one year, then the state takes it. They just reduced the payment after yeah. that. So, so it's the, the state, another, another the, the state loves to see our assessed values go up because they know that reduces their funding requirements. And that, so, so the state really, in fact, I'm sure Mr. Castro would tell you, the state forces them to appraise at market value because that's the whole concept of Robin Hood is you have appraisals across the state. In other words, they, they, the state doesn't want one district appraising at 100% of market value and another one appraising at 50% of market value. They force everybody to appraise at 100% market value. Now, the general public doesn't understand that either because uh, they, they don't understand why their appraisals keep going up. It's because the state has, a, has, a, has an interest in making sure that everybody appraises at market value. Is there a separate proposal for your 22 million, or is that part of the budget, or do we have to? What we're proposing is we do nothing with the 22 million, that it goes into say, into the general fund, so that we're going to see an increase in our general fund, so it's there if we have to access it next year. So when we approve, when it's proposed, the budget, that's part of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Whereas last year I made a recommendation that we take that surplus and spend it, I'm making a recommendation this year because of the Robin Hood effect is back in play that we hold on to that until we see what happens next year. Mr. Cox, I mean, for years you have kept us, uh, we're, we are successful financially in large part to your ability to manage these numbers and keep it and, and I applaud you okay so when I when I ask you these questions I don't want you to think that I, I, I in other words uh, you hedge for all the right reasons not the wrong reasons mm -hmm. okay and I appreciate that but looking at 31 and looking at 22 we're putting 22 back and you say you know we have a potential risk of 31 if we didn't have any EV growth or student growth right. okay but if we have the 1100 and we have the five percent something reasonable not 12 not 16 not whatever okay then then you're looking at the difference of in like instead of 31 you're looking at the difference of like 12 right is that is that a but, more and, and if we end up there we're not going to have to access if we do have to access some of the 22 million we put in the bank it'll just be a very little bit a part of it right, right. but and, the other part of it 
could be used as we always do, buy down the debt, reduce the tax rate as we have two years in a row, so on and so forth, right? right? Okay. Capital fund. And we have so a, the unknown we're right not, now. We're, we're still preserving the amount that we used to buy down the debt. That's well, well, the 16th. Yeah, right. But I'm talking about in addition, whatever, or build a school out of cash or, or whatever we do. Yeah, and, and, and if, if we, once we get to next spring and we know what's going to happen after, well, we get far enough into the legislative session, we know what's going to happen, we'll, we'll have a much better feel as to whether some of that funding that we've saved uh, is available to use, maybe do something without using debt again or whatever. You know, those, Thank you. Those options will be available. Uh, the the big prize again is uh, for the third year in a row we are going to we're proposing to reduce the uh, tax rate by a half a cent, bringing us to a dollar twenty eight. Uh, this puts us at forty eight cents uh, below the the peak at uh, two thousand five two thousand six. Uh, in addition, I, I think it compares very favorably to our peer districts both uh, in the immediate area and all across the Houston area. Uh, I think we're, I think we can be proud of what we've done and still kept one of the lowest tax rates really in this state, certainly for any fast growth school district. Do you have the slide that compares? Well, we, I will at the next presentation. Uh, this is, uh, at the next presentation we'll have all of that. We are on average in, a, in our peer groups uh, districts that are similar in size and makeup were on average, I think, 17 cents lower. Uh, so uh, we're, we're proud to be able to do this again for the third year in a row. Uh, what's next? Again, as, as I indicated earlier, we'll get uh, <coughs> local certified AV on July 25th. That's when we'll be able to actually finalize our projected revenue. Uh, we're going to have a public hearing on August 5th and August 19th, and also on August 19th, at that point, we'll approve the budget uh, and the tax rate. So uh, that's what that's all that remains. Mr. Cox, any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Cox? Item 5B, financial reports, Dr. Stock. Mr. Rice, if you'll come up and present the financial reports tonight. Mr. Husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, I'm here tonight to present the financial statements for the district for the month of May. Uh, these statements will include our general fund, debt service fund, child nutrition, and our self-funded insurance. Uh, the first statement we'll look at is our balance sheet. It includes our assets, liabilities, and fund balances for the district. One of the areas we always like to look at uh, is our cash and investments. Uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, we have 64 $0.7 million invested in the general fund in our external pools, uh, a little over $100 million in our Capital One Now account. Uh, that accounts at 25 basis points. The external pool, uh, the pool funds are anywhere from 5 basis points to roughly 15 basis points. And then if you look at the, uh, at the end, the U.S. Treasury notes, we have about $21 million right now that is invested out from a year and a half to three years, anywhere from 40 basis points to uh, uh, 1.10 percent. So, I mean, 1.1 uh, percent. So, so good return on the, on those. And so I said, give me the basis points on the uh, pool, the capital, the, the one now account. 25 basis points. And the treasury note. Uh, they're ranging anywhere from 40 basis points to 1.1. 1 .1. What's the what's the um, maturity on on? But I'll show you those, and I'll show you those in just just a moment. Then we always like to look at our property tax collections, make sure that we're in line with where we've been in previous years. We're right, right on track of where we've been. We're we're still looking to exceed 100% collections when you take into account uh, delinquents and penalty and interest. The next statement we'll look at is our income statement. Uh, it shows our revenues and expenditures. I always like to look at our, you know, our, our second line of state program revenues. That's the, that's the funding we receive from the state. But uh, looking at our local revenues, of course, the, the largest item is our property taxes. But if we look down the list, 
uh, you can see building rental, a little over a million a year. Uh, Co-curricular student activities, that's ticket sales to our athletic events, drama, plays, etc. We, we, we're earning close to a million dollars a year there. And then other, a little over a million dollars. The biggest piece of that is our E-rate refund that we get for our dark fiber that we're putting in. It, it uh, constitutes rebates that we get for putting in fiber that, that earns, earns these special rebates on, on those. So uh, that's the largest piece of that. General fund balance, uh, currently we're projecting uh, an increase of about $6.7 million. Now with the uh, retrofit that we're going to do with the LED lightings, that projection is going to come down a little bit because we'll fund that out of the fund balance. Uh, no change in our projection uh, from last month on debt service. Uh, no change in our, in our projection on the child nutrition. Uh, Self-funded insurance, once again, month of May, we had a good month for our, for our insurance plan. We had total revenues of $2.7 million for the month of May. We had expenses of about $2.5 million. So revenues over expenses uh, for this month, about $240,000, so a good month. Uh, for the year, our revenues are over expenses of $725,000. So, so on the plus side this year, as Mr. Cox said earlier, a good year. Our participation at our wellness centers, the Oak Ridge Center for the month had 493 participants. Conroe, 114 for a total of 607, so our participation in our clinics is still very strong. Our 2014-2015 bond transition plan, as you know, this is the $109 million bond transition plan. Uh, we have currently expended and encumbered $55.3 million. Our uh, estimate to complete our projects is another uh, $50.2 million, leaving us with a completed projected forecast of $105.5 million leaving us with some contingency of $3.4 million in our, in our plan. Now, as we're looking at our investments, uh, at the end of uh, April, we had $340 million invested. At the end of May, $300 million invested. Uh, our pools and the Capital One account, their WAM is one day to us. Those, those are liquid monies that we can get every day. Our U.S. Treasury notes, that also now includes a few CDs and some uh, federal home loan bank uh, purchases that we did, but that wham is 728 days on those. A little less than two years. That's what I did. Yeah. Gotcha. But that makes our total portfolios wham 63 days. Good. When you When you look at the weighted piece of that. Now, the yield, yield to maturity of our portfolio, taking all into account is a little over 20 basis points. And our benchmark, the 90-day T-bill, is about three basis points. Now, had we not made any of these changes that we've worked on over the you know past year, right. we would be around this three basis points. The, the pools that we were in would have us about three basis points. So right now we're 17 basis of points, 17 basis points above where we would be uh, this time last year. Sure. That's all we have. Mr. Rice, any questions for Mr. Rice? Good, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Good job, Mr. Ryan. Okay, we do not have a need for an executive session, so we'll go to item nine legal. Dr. Stockton, con uh, consider a resolution approving the expansion and remodeling of the facilities of the Montgomery County Appraisal District. I will turn this over to Mrs. Gladys. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. Mr. Husbands, the members of the board, is, um, you've been pointed out to you several times, including Mr. Cashtreet's in the audience, to answer any questions you may have about this item. But the appraisal district is asking to expand its facilities like everything else in Montgomery County. It continues um, to need to expand because we're growing and growing. And so um, in order to do that, they have to get uh, approval from the jurisdictions within their authority. They need three quarters of them to approve to allow them to expand. And if three quarters of them do, they can add on to their facility. And if you vote to do that, there's a resolution that we would ask you to approve tonight. Cash sheets available to answer any questions. Um, welcome. Cash Good evening. We, we appreciate you and known you a long time and appreciate all you do for our county. Um, tell us, just tell us a little bit about how long you've been in the building, how much room you have, how much room you need. We've actually been in the building since 1986. We built it new, 12,800 square feet. We added on in 2001. And we also went out and had a study, Broadus Planning, um, who does studies for schools and governmental entities, performed a study for us and the county tax office talking about <clears throat> number of employees we'd need over the coming years based upon growth. 
and then the amount of square footage we'd need. And the plan actually mirrored what we were saying all along. It just cost us $35,000 to find that out. We needed approximately 35,000 square feet and we were going to grow to approximately 128 people by the year 2025 to 2028. We look, by law, we have to come to every entity. That is correct. We also have to give you options. We have to show you what it would cost if we went out and purchased new land, built a new building. We presented you with information stating that would be between 8.1 and $8.8 .8 million, depending upon where you built it. We also gave you information regarding a six, a 10, and a 15-year lease, 4.2 million to 10.2 million approximately. That's like throwing money down the drain. We've been located where we are now since 1986. We're known there. We have the room to expand the facilities. We're asking to build 15,000 square feet of office space and expand our appraisal review board hearing rooms and to remodel the existing building. It's aged. We're looking at LED lighting. We're looking at geothermal uh, heating and cooling. And we're looking at a new roof. Freshen it up, and we'll be there long after I'm gone. It'll be a place the taxpayers know where to go, can come, and we'll be able to service them uh, just as we work with your financial guys here, provide quality service and a quality product. So that's what we're asking, uh, approval of a resolution uh, for us to expand our facilities. Okay, just just for the record, a couple of questions. What percentage of the three quarters of your votes uh, does CISD represent? Well, the cities, schools, the county, and the junior college count as one vote apiece. All the other special districts that are eligible to vote all combine together to create one vote. The emergency service districts and the hospital districts are not eligible to vote since they do not vote for the board of directors. So, so it's, 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 it's one of five, one of six votes, something like that? One out of 27. 27, okay. Several years ago, I came before this board and, and kind of got a, my rear end chewed a little bit. It was a little bit bigger at that time because we didn't come to Conroe first. Uh, as I explained to the board at that time, it was not my call. 13, 14 years ago it is now. So we're we're here early. I've lost 30 pounds, so my derriere is not quite as big enough, so we're coming to you first to ask for approval. Okay, and the uh, other question I have is the amount that you're asking. We're asking for $4 million, up to $4 million. We'll still have to go out for bid on this particular project. We've worked with a couple vendors to try and firm up some numbers. Worst case scenario, we're looking at a 20-year note, 4% interest, up to $4 million. We will not exceed that $4 million figure, and it will accomplish what we need to accomplish uh, for the facilities. Now, I'm assuming since uh, you all been there 28 years? Long time. And that says you're looking to stay long-term as well? Yes. Any other questions, discussion? Very good. Um, and we have the resolution uh, uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve or adopt. Motion. So Thank move. And second. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed like sign. Thank you very much, Mr. Keshul. Thank you. We appreciate it. And I think his 5% number is a little low on his estimate of next year's increases. <laughs> <laughs> I know he appreciates that. I got a good attack. And in completing our business, we have a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. We are adjourned.